Bible class. I invite you to stand together as we get started this evening. We're going to go before the Lord in prayer before we get into the word of the Lord tonight. So uh, any prayer requests that we can pray with you about this evening? Safe travels home. Yes, it is snowing a little bit out there. Yes, Sister Jane. Okay. Very good. Anyone else? Prayer requests? Yes. Okay. Amen. It's good to see Sister Weeks. We've been praying for you, Sister Weeks. Prayer requests this evening. Okay. All right. So let's go before the Lord together with these. But first, let's open our hearts and our and our minds and our mouths and just praise the Lord just for a minute. Give Him some thanks, Father. We thank you together this evening. We give you honor, we give you praise today. You are high and lifted up, Lord. You are worthy of all of the worship and all of the praise. You're worthy, God, of all of the accolades. And, and Lord, all of the honor and all of the glory belongs to you today. You're the creator of all things. By you and for you, all things were made. And they exist for you, God. You are the author and the finisher of our faith. You are the Lord of glory. You are the King of kings. And you are God, high and lifted up. You're high above every adversary, God. You're high above man's thoughts. You're high above the governments of this earth. You're high above, Lord, uh, Lord, the, the natural elements of our world. You're so high and lifted up, God. Lord, your victory is certain, Lord. Your word is true, Father. Your, uh, your promises are forever, amen and amen. We thank you, God, today that you are, you are so far beyond man, God, that you are the only true king of kings and Lord of lords, and you are the only one who was able to live and die and live again. Lord, you have the keys to death and to hell and the grave. You have all power and authority in heaven and earth and everything under the earth, God. Every principality bows to you, God. Every, every spirit, God, in high places, Lord, does not ascend higher than your throne, Lord, but are subject unto you, Lord God. And we honor you as the Lord of all. You are the Lord God, the Almighty God. We thank you and we give you praise today. Lord, you are our healer. You are Jehovah Rapha today. We pray, God, for Jessica Doty. We pray for Patrick Skelly. We pray for Tamara Weeks and Pat Bytro. We pray for Aubrey Brought, Lord, in the name of Jesus. God, you are the provider and you make provision through your blood. By your stripes, we are healed. And we claim that promise. We claim that provision, Lord that you've given to us, Lord. We thank you for it. You are also the God of all wisdom and all knowledge and all revelation, Lord. And there is nothing beyond you, Lord God. And so we're asking for the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you, Lord, to come upon your people, to rest upon this congregation tonight, to open the eyes of our understanding and open our hearts that faith may rise in our spirits today. And we would proclaim you as the only true living God. We give you honor and we give you praise today. We worship you. We give you the glory in the name of Jesus. I wonder if you clap your hands with me today. Thank you, we thank you. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. You can be seated. There should be an offering basket coming around and uh, continue to give unto the Lord as He has prospered you. <clears throat> Coffee and conversation is this coming Sunday morning at 9 40 a.m. Come early. 
We provide the coffee. You provide the conversation. Um, also, this coming Monday, February 17th at 7 p.m. is our annual business meeting for Bethel Christian Ministries. It is in the prayer room to my, to my left, your right, and it'll start promptly at 7. It'll, prox- it'll approximately go for about one hour in this meeting. We elect uh, trustees uh, to hold the properties of our campus in trust. Uh, also, we go over the financial uh, review for 2019. And uh, we, we like to think that we're very transparent with that. So if you'd like to know how much money we brought in and that's kind of your thing um, and where it's all going, you're welcome to come to that meeting. Um, and any business that happens to come up during that meeting, that's when we talk about some of those things. And uh, so you all are welcome to come in order to be a voting member in that for the for the various voting you have to be a member of Bethel Christian Ministry be paying your tithe faithfully and have obeyed the uh, gospel as set forth repentance baptism in Jesus name receive the gift of the holy ghost and uh, so there's you can come at, but in order to vote those are some of the qualifications so I wouldn't want you to get there and be, then be disappointed uh, if uh, if if uh, we didn't allow you to vote but we invite you to come. We're so glad um, that if that's something that you'd like to know about, you are more than welcome to come. Uh, check out the Get Involved wall um, for more events that's happening at BCM. And there's a lot of things going on. I understand that some, some were here last night until 11, 12 o'clock, dipping strawberries and pretzels and getting all of that ready. And so we thank you for uh, those of you that volunteered and help with that endeavor. Um, We're going to continue our study this evening on the sound of righteousness. Righteousness just has a certain sound to it. Things that are uh, true uh, should uh, have a certain sound to us, should should trigger certain things in our hearts as being right and true. They used to believe some strange things in the past, and and now they don't ring true. You know, sometimes error has a certain sound to it, but truth has a, has a different sound true, uh, to it. But years ago, they used to think that traveling by train could cause instant insanity. And uh, probably, I don't know, some train rides probably could, could cause that. Um, they used to think that you could cure depression and anxiety Here's a good home remedy. They used to think you could cure depression and anxiety by jamming an ice pick into someone's eye socket. Yeah. That doesn't ring true with me. <laughs> um, let's see here. They used to think that evil spirits lurk in Brussels sprouts. <laughs> Some people are not in your head. That is still the case. Um, they used to believe in, in the higher academia. They used to believe that if you did not learn cursive, then you did not have a future. I don't even think they teach cursive in high school anymore. Or grade school, I mean. They definitely don't teach it in high school if you ain't got it by... High school, you probably need to go back, but no, so it used to be no cursive, no future, and boy, that's changed, hasn't it? Um, back in the day, people believed that sneezing was a sign of your soul literally trying to escape your body. That's why they, it became customary to say, bless you, after someone sneezed, to try to keep your soul in your body. So some things just don't ring true, there's, there's a certain sound. Um, that when somebody says something, there's a rightness or a wrongness about it. Um, in the kingdom of God, there's a certain rightness that ought to ring in our hearts. There's a sound of righteousness that ought to hit our hearts and, and our minds. And you would think that, that everybody should be able to pick up on those sounds of rightness and righteousness. But the reality is, is not everybody hears righteousness. Not everybody is able to pick up on the sounds of righteousness. And you and I often take for granted the power of God's word in our life. 
that, I'll, that is a shield, that faith is a shield. And the word of God is something that he gives to us that protects us. And so the things that we think are commonplace and the things that we think that everybody should believe and that's the way everybody should think and everybody should know that's right and that's true, uh, it just doesn't, doesn't have that same sound in people's lives. And, but I do thank God that we know and we know the spirit of truth and we can also identify his words of truth in us. And the spirit leads and guides us into all truth, the Bible says. And so there is a certain righteousness about God's people that whether or not the world identifies it or not is irrelevant. But we as God's people need to understand and hear the sound of righteousness. Righteousness is good. It's an, uh, an ability to discern, to make, this, to make judicial estimations between good and evil. It's an ability to hear or discern truth and error. And it is essential to hear those acoustics, that sound of righteousness. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 13 and 14 is one of those scriptures. I will reread it to you um, for the beginning scripture tonight. Hebrews chapter 5. Verse 13 and 14. Brother Patrick, would you mind standing and reading that for me into the mic? Thank you. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongs to them that are full of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Very good. Just hang on to that mic. You did so well tonight. Do you mind reading for me tonight? Oh, no, sir. Oh, thank you. Um, so according to this verse, if you'll put those verses back up there, Hebrews chapter 5 says that there is, um, there is a developmental process in the heart of a believer that this process is a mark of spiritual maturity. And it's an ability to discern between what is right and what is wrong. And it, it is exercised, that ability is exercised by using the word of righteousness or exposing your heart to the word of God continually so that God's word can mold our thought processes. When the Bible talks about put on the mind of Christ, it's not just talking about, oh, that God loves everything. It's the way God thinks. It's the way this, it's, it's God's thoughts drive God's actions. And God's people need to be desirous of understanding God's thoughts. And the Bible is the visual expression of God's thoughts toward us. When we read the Bible, it's a beautiful thing because we get a sense of the way God thinks. How many of you know his, the way he thinks isn't the way we think? And our human reaction is not always God's reaction. And, and so that's the beauty of, of studying God's word from that perspective is, is trying to identify rightness. And so spiritual maturity comes when we exercise in the word of righteousness. When we become skillful, the Bible uses the word skillful. In the word of righteousness. And we're able to put line upon line. And precept upon precept. Much like mathematics. Where you start with the elementary ideals. Of addition, subtraction, uh, multiplication and division. But those are the building blocks. So that you can do calculus. And you can do trigonometry. If you don't get the fundamental. The elementary things correct. Then you will never progress. Into higher levels of mathematics. So it is with the idea of understanding the righteousness of God and understanding the base and elementary things of God. They're building blocks, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little, Isaiah said. And so as you mature in God, you don't necessarily have to 
to uh, know all the details because you already got a sense or a sound of righteousness and the development of an ability to identify what is good and what is evil. And this is what is wrong with our world is that when you take the word of God out of your schools and you take it out of your government and you say it has no place in our lives, then people's sense of discernment of good and evil, begin that, that edge begins to soften and it's no longer a sharp distinction between what is right and what is wrong. And so every Everything becomes gray and now nobody knows anything and now who's right and who's wrong we don't know and so a little boy can think he's a girl and come home to his parents and say hey mom and dad I think I'm a, I'm a girl trapped in a boy's body well who's to say that's right and who's wrong when every man does that which is right in his own eyes when everybody has their own truth and truth now becomes relative instead of a person, Jesus Christ. Now our nation is spiraling out of control because the word of God is no longer an anchor that allows us to come to a sure and steadfast place that is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. That light is extinguished and now we're stumbling in the darkness and we all think we're smart but we're actually ignorant and we're foolish. Because there is no light in us. So brothers and sisters, I ask you to grow in your skillful use of the word of God. I, I, I encourage you to not just wait for Sunday to open up that book and meditate in the law of God. Because blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of the sinner, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But the psalmist said in his opening chapter, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in it does he meditate day and night. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters. His leaf shall not wither. Brothers and sisters, our claim to fame is not what we know, but our, our, our tenacity to hold on to God's word as the truth. Even though we can't explain everything in there, even though I don't have an answer for everybody, I know he is the answer to everything that we have need of. I don't want you to start in conversation with people of what you think and how you feel on social issues. You need, to, you need to default to what does God say. Does God have a starting point? Does God have a place of beginning? Does God have an anchor point? Let's go there first and then I'll hang my feelings on that acceptability of God or that denial of God for that specific subject. Does it have a sound of righteousness to us? These are the ways that we should live our lives. Not what our culture is doing. Not what they're saying is popular or unpopular. But what does God's word say? Does it have a sound, that certain sound of rightness about it? Isaiah 9 and 6 is a wonderful passage. Patrick, if you would read Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, mm. and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Verse 7. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it, to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Praise God. Isn't that awesome? Uh, five names that this child, this is a great revelation. Uh, this child is a son and his name is going to be called five things, wonderful. His name wasn't wonderful. What was his name? Jesus. So wonderful was a description of who he was, not what his name was. His name shall be called Counselor. His name wasn't Counselor. If Mary, that, that angel didn't appear to Joseph and Mary say, hey, you call his name Counselor. No, he said, you'll call his name Jesus. 
but he was counselor. You're going to call him, his, his name is the mighty God according to Isaiah 9 and 6, but that's not his name, that's who he was. The everlasting father, that's a great revelation. Uh, that everlasting father wasn't the name, that's who Jesus was. So when you call the name of Jesus and you see Jesus on the throne, you say, Jesus, well, who is that? That's the everlasting father for us. He's the prince of peace. That's not his name. That's who he was. That's his DNA. But his name is Jesus. Verse 7, it says, of the increase of his government. Everybody say government. Do you know God governs a certain way? And what is government? It's the establishment of truths and rules and rightness and unrighteousness. Do you know that God has established rules of right and wrong for humanity? It has never changed. I don't care if you're B.C. or A.D. It doesn't change with God. Sin is still sin. Can I get an amen? amen. Right is still right. Wrong is still wrong with God. It doesn't change because our culture thinks it's more advanced than any other culture in its history we are still under the same judgment. And if we're going to come under the kingdom of righteousness, we have to come under his governance. That's why it demands repentance. You're going to get into the kingdom of God. You're going to get under his governance. You have to get under the blood. Because all have sinned against the justice or governance of God. We're alienated by our sin from his governance. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. It's going to be a government of, uh, of peace. There shall be no end. And people think, oh, that's just all nice. And, 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 and it's just all love and hearts and Cupid with arrows. And everything's just fluffy. No, it's righteousness. Do you know when Jesus comes back, he's going to rule and reign on the earth for a thousand years. How many of you know that's in your Bible? He's going to sit in Jerusalem and rule the nations of the world. Do you know that it's not just going to be, oh, do whatever you want. You know, you know, Ricky, you start, you start a continent and you, you can go do your own thing. He's going to say, no, no, if you're going, I'm going to reign in peace. And peace has a process. And peace has a justice. And peace has a rightness about it. It's not okay to go do what you want to do. I am in charge of the globe now. Does that make sense? Jesus isn't haphazard. Jesus' leadership isn't do what you want and it's just love and it's all okay. No, sir. No, ma'am. It's a kingdom. He's going to order it. Somebody say he's going to order it. It has an order to it. Do you know that when you pray the kingdom of God, Lord, let your kingdom come. Do you know what you're praying? Do you know what you're really saying? Wow. It's not the American government that's ordering that. But just like the American government, there are laws of right and wrong in his kingdom. I thank God for his righteousness. He's going to order it. He's going to establish it with judgment. Somebody say judgment. God's going to use judgment to establish his kingdom. In fact, you can't be in his kingdom without the judgment of God. Can I get an amen? You need the judgment of God in your life if you are ever ever going to be saved you need the righteous judgments of God in your life this is why the message of sloppy agape is what I call it grace only uh, is such a farce because it, 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 it removes the justice and the judgment of God from, from the reality of living for God his kingdom is not full of sin and unrighteousness. No, his kingdom knows no sin. His kingdom knows no unrighteousness. And so if we ever have hope of being in his kingdom, we need his grace to help train us and teach us his righteousness, his ways, and not our ways. Does that make sense? It's so important that we understand, I need to learn the ways of God. So many people are driven by how they feel 
Can I tell you the kingdom of God is not driven by how you feel. It's driven by what the Lord has declared. He is going to order it and He is going to establish it. But religion for so many has become so degraded and so pulled apart and so unraveled that they make every decision by how they feel instead of what they know. People have got to be driven and, and be taught the ways. You know, the judgments of God can and need to be learned. Just like you teach a child how to walk, you teach a child how to ride a bicycle. It's not perfection, but it is learning the ways of God. You teach a child mathematics, you got to sit at the table. How many of you try to teach a kid some math? You got any hair left? It's crazy. It's tough because they're little brains. It, it, it's work. You have to focus. You have to repetition. This is the way it is. But, but the laws of God are no different. We have got to learn the ways of righteousness. We got to be committed to saying, God, how do you respond in this situation? Just because a husband you know, gets mad and flies off the handle and throws something across the room in, in the confines and the privacy of his own home. You know, he needs to learn the ways of God, doesn't he? It's not just, well, that's just the way I am. How many of you heard that before? Well, that's just the way I am. Well, we're all sinners, but Lord, help us to grow and to learn the ways of God. I'm just a liar. That's the way God made me. I, I, I'm just, just going to keep lying. That's just the way I am. No, you can learn the ways of God. You can learn the ways of righteousness, can't you? How many of you learned some ways of God since you've been walking with him? We sure. Does that learning process ever quit? No. And so from our attitude to our thought processes to our actions, everything is submitted to the kingdom of God. This is why we mature in God. This is how we grow in God. So Psalm 119, 107, and 108. You'd read that for us, Brother Patrick. Psalm 119, 107, 108. I am afflicted very much. Quicken me, O Lord, according unto thy word. Accept, I beseech thee, the free will offerings of my mouth, O Lord, and teach me thy judgments. So, yep, that's incredible. He said, Lord, teach me. Everybody say, teach me thy judgments. David wasn't talking about, oh, Lord, teach me the love of God. That's not what David was asking. Teach me your ways, oh, God. Teach me your ways, oh, God. Let's look at another one. Um, Titus 2.11. Titus 2.11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men. Read the next verse as well. Teaching us that, denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Look at verse 13. That's a good set of scripture. Keep reading. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Whew. You're getting anointed now. Verse 14. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Verse 15. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Woo. Thank you. So uh, Titus was an understudy of, t of, of Paul. And Paul's writing to, to Titus. And, and look what he says in verse 11. He says, the grace of God. Somebody say the grace of God. Grace of God. How many are thankful for the grace of God? Uh, I believe in the grace of God. 
I live because of the grace of God. That grace that brought salvation unto all men. What is the grace of God doing according to verse 12? Huh? Look at verse 12. Does it say teaching? Teaches us to say no. Where's that scripture at? There it is. Thank you. Teaching us. Everybody say teaching us. So this idea that you can come into the house of God and get saved and never learn anything is a farce. You're not listening to the Holy Ghost. What is the Holy Ghost saying? Oh, it doesn't matter. I, it, it, it frosts me. When people that are saved keep living the life that they're living and they say that they hear the Holy Ghost every day, but they're living in sin. They are deaf to righteousness. They are deaf to the acoustics of the Spirit. And they are deaf to the acoustics of the grace of God. Because the grace of God is not silent. It will say, it will say, thy sins be forgiven thee. But it also will say, go and sin no more. And if all you hear is you are forgiven, then you have perverted the grace of God. And you cannot hear the sounds of the Spirit. Grace is awesome, isn't it? Because it not only forgives me, it teaches me to deny. Everybody say ungodliness. See, here's here's our problem, church, is that we never unpack that word ungodliness so that it touches our everyday living. It's just the word that is left undefined in our lives. What is ungodliness? Because the grace of God is teaching us to back away from ungodliness. So what is ungodliness? Who establishes what godliness is? And if you establish what godliness is, anything that is not godliness is therefore rendered ungodly but the problem is is very few people come to this scripture to realize that after salvation and after you get forgiven there's a whole lot of learning the rest of your life is learning to walk by the voice of the spirit and he will lead you out of darkness into his marvelous light the grace of God will never leave you where he found you Ever. If we are not better a year from now, as people, as husbands, as wives, as worshipers, then we are not listening to the voice of the Holy Ghost. Because He will lead us and guide us into all truth. Thank God. He, you're teaching us several things. To deny ungodliness. What's the next one? Worldly lusts. Do you know that God has an opinion about what the world is doing and what the world is desiring? Do you know the heartbeat of the world is what's coming next on the big screen? You know that drives many people is what's coming out on the movie screen? That's their world. What are you doing this weekend? Well, I'm going to watch a movie. What's what's playing? What's playing? That's how they live their life. God help us if that is our whole future. What are you doing this week? I'm going to go worship God. I I want want to find out what God's saying. You know, the entertainment of this world is not my world. Do I I partake of some of it? Sure, but it's not my world. I don't live for it. I don't consume it as the only thing in my life. In fact, if I do consume it, how many of you know there better be some parameters for it? It better be bracketed, and it needs to be filtered, and it needs to have a comma beside it, because that stuff is not produced by the living God. It's produced by worldliness. Brothers 
and sisters, if there's a sticker tree, I don't know if one such tree exists, but if there's a strict sticker plant, it will not produce apples. And Hollywood does not produce righteousness. Worldly lusts. I mean, how big is that word? <laughs> That's a big word. That almost touches every part of our life every day, doesn't it? And so there's a, there's a sound of righteousness that the grace of God is trying to teach us. And it's not always, well, it's okay, it's okay. He does say, don't touch some of those things. Don't touch. If you're not hearing God say, don't touch that and put that down, I don't know that you're listening to the right voice. Because it's righteousness. Do you know how some people, you know, our culture determines, our culture determines the fads of dress. Do you know that? You know, just because our culture says that's the way you should dress doesn't mean that that's what Christians should hear and say that's okay then. That's why apostolics believe that men look like men, women look like women. Because the Holy Ghost teaches something different than the voice of the world. And ladies, you need to be careful not to get caught up with the voice of the world. Because if you think that the voice of the world is the voice of God, you're in trouble. You have to fight for the voice of God, ladies, in your life for righteous dress and righteous presentation. Men, we need to be careful about what we hear that the world says that a man is because it will redefine those sounds in our hearts and we'll be chasing the wrong thing. Sounds of righteousness. Uh, uh, worldly lusts. Contrawise, we should live how? Soberly. And righteously. And Godly, where? Now. It's not enough just to read this Bible and go to church and say, yes, I'm a believer. If there is no righteous living now, then the word of God is of no value in your life. Right? He goes on. Why are we living this way? Just so that we can say we're different? No, what are we doing? Looking for a blessed hope. What's your hope today? Glorious appearing of our great God. Who's our God? Jesus Christ. He's also our Savior. Watch, watch this. Next verse. He gave himself for us. Why, why did he give himself for us? That he might. Everybody say might. You know, some people are unredeemable because they refuse to listen to the teaching of grace in their life. Hello? If you, will, if you are deaf to the teaching of grace, then you will not be purified and therefore you will not be redeemable unto Christ. All iniquity and purify unto himself. The teaching of grace does what to our hearts? purifies, cleanses, this is called sanctification. It cleanses us from all unrighteousness and should produce a people zealous, excited about the things of the kingdom of God. This is another thing that I don't understand about God's people, even in myself, is that you are not excited about the kingdom of God and the things of God. There is more excitement in some Christians about what they're doing with their hobby than, than their excitement in the house of worship, than their excitement in the things of God. Wow. Where's your passion? This is the things that the grace of God teaches. Has anybody ever, ever, ever heard the grace and the Spirit of God saying, hey, you need to be careful in that area of your life because you're getting a little too attached to it. You know God's a jealous God. He doesn't like you flirting and giving your passion to, to, uh, to things greater than Him. How many of you have experienced that? That voice of the Holy Ghost. Even if it's right and it's not technically wrong, when you start letting your heart run after things, that Holy Spirit, that grace will say, come here, set it down. How many of you, how many of you have ever heard the Holy Ghost tell you to set it down? 
Thank God for that sound of righteousness. Why is he doing that? Is that because he doesn't want you to have fun? No, it's because he's a loving God and he's a caring God. And he's wanting to teach you the ways of righteousness. And what you don't see is if you keep listening to that voice, it can pull you out of his presence and make you unredeemable. Because God doesn't ride second class. He said, I and I only am the Lord. And beside me, there is no Savior. So I I encourage you to to write down Titus uh, chapter 2, verse 11 through 14, and memorize it. Because this ought to be what drives our heart to learn the ways of God. The sound of righteousness. This is why if you read this and memorize it, somebody can come up and talk to you about what they're wanting to do and where they're wanting to go. And and if there's no sound of God, I can already go, there's something missing. There's just something missing. If if, if people can talk to us and they don't get at least a little glimpse of of how, how our love for God comes out of our... Something is missing in our lives. I'm not talking about boasting or being... So crazy forward that it drives. I'm just talking about living. If this is in us, it comes out of us with great joy and great peace because it's our life. It's our love. My daughter's in here. I'm so proud of her. She's getting married soon. I'm excited for her. I don't have to ask her to talk about Andrew. She's in love. And her whole world is framed through that lens. If you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, it's going to come out. You won't have to force it. You won't have to manipulate it. It's just who I am. My life is being changed by my Savior. All right. So somebody said we can learn the ways of righteousness. And God's teaching us and God's trying to mold us. So, so Moses is coming out of Egypt and he's got three million people and all of them got problems. Because people, the, the synonym for people is problem. I, I'm sorry to tell you that the church also has problems. Because there's people in it. So many people get disillusioned because they think the place of worship ought to be perfect. There's no place perfect because you're in it. Smile at somebody. It's okay. We're all people and we all got problems. It's just you think their problem is worse than yours. That's why you isolate. But you are so disillusioned. Because other people look at you and say, your problem is worse than my problem. So I'm going to sit five seats away from you in case it's it's contagious. Right? So we become judges of each other's problems. And the reality is that we're all people that need Jesus. We all need the Lord. Moses has got people and that means problem. And... <clears throat> he finds himself in Exodus 18, verse 13. He's, he's getting up in the morning, and he's in the middle of brushing his teeth, and he gets a knock on the door. And it's Betty and Susie. They got a problem. So he finishes, brushes his teeth. He goes, sits down outside on his porch, and he, he helps solve the problems. Because God, Moses, it's not something in his brain. He says, well, let me think. You're going to bring me your problem, and let me think here a minute. What would I do? No, no. Moses has been on the mountain with God for 40 days and 40 nights. What's God doing while Moses is in the mountain? He's pumping the mind of Moses full of his judgments. This is right, and this is wrong. He didn't just write 10 little thou shalt nots and then just kind of twiddle his thumbs up there for the rest of the time. Moses was being taught the ways of God by God himself. So much so that his face shone with the glory of God when he come down. 
When Moses come down, he was a walking God encyclopedia. You ever think about that? He was literally pumped full of the judgments of God because God said, I want you to lead my people in my ways. Wow. So, you know, they're sitting on the porch and, and he barely gets done with Susie and Betty and then here comes John and Andrew and they, and they say, well, I got a problem. John said this and I, he did this and I, what, what do we do? Moses? So Moses goes through his God encyclopedia and says, this is what God said. This is righteousness according to God. He barely gets done with that. And, and just the line. Now cars are pulling up. He's got a line. He doesn't even get to take a lunch. At one point he said, excuse me, I have to go use the restroom. I'll be back. I'm sorry. He goes to use the restroom. On the way back he, gra he grabs a Triscuit and a piece of cheese. And he sits down. He barely swallows it. And they're demanding his time. Why? Because people got problems. And they need the righteous judgment of God in their life. So they're coming to Moses. God, uh, Moses, help me deal with this. So Moses sits, and, and now the sun's going down. The line isn't any shorter. In fact, it's a little longer. He's got to say, look, i got to go to bed. Come back tomorrow. So he's doing this. So sun up to sun down. It's Exodus, this is Exodus chapter 18, verse 13. Moses' father-in-law watches him a couple times and says, Moses, you're crazy. You're going to burn yourself out. So Moses' father-in-law says, now I'm not the one who heard the judgments of God, but I am smart enough to know that you probably ought to teach what you know and what God gave you to some other people. So that they can help you with the judgments of God and dispersing those judgments to God's people. This is what he says, Exodus 18, verse 19 and 20 and 21. Go ahead, Brother Patrick. Hearken now unto my voice. I will give thee counsel, and God shall be with thee. Be thou for the people to Godward that thou mayest bring the causes unto God. And thou shalt teach them ordinances and laws, and shalt show them the way within, th wherein they must walk, and the work that they must do. Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hate and covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands and rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. Verse 22. And let them judge the people at all seasons, and it shall be that every great matter they shall bring unto thee, be every small matter they shall judge, so that it be easier for thyself, and they shall bear the burden with thee. Excellent. Thank you. And so the, the judgments of God, when we talk about the judgments of God, it's not just the Ten Commandments. It's how do we deal with people. What is righteous and what is not righteous. So again, many people think that their relationship with God just deals with their vertical relationship with God. They're like, well, I love God and don't, everybody else can just go fly a kite, you know, be Mary Poppins, whatever. I, me and God are cool. That's not the way the kingdom of God works. Jesus uh, in the New Testament, uh, vicariously through the Apostle John said, how can you say you love, your, you love God when you hate your brother? You're a liar. You can't say you love righteousness and the things of God if you are unrighteous in your dealings with men. Amen. This is a true test of how much we love and yield to God. It's not what we say to God, but how we deal in ways of judgment with other people. People say, don't judge me. I beg to differ. I know how spiritual or how unspiritual you are based upon how you deal in situations in your life. Are the judgments of God in you? And so we read through the Old Testament so fast that we just, okay, I'm just going to go through the reading. All this Old Testament stuff doesn't even matter. I beg to differ. Every one of the judgments that God gave to, to Moses on Mount Sinai, that's the way he thinks people should act. And he's going to hold the world accountable to those things. 
Do you know the Bible says that every idle word, Jesus said, Jesus said, every idle word shall be judged. If every idle word, then every action for sure will be judged. Not just to him, but how we treat one another. So loving the judgments of God has much to do with him, yes, but it has much to do with how even the body of Christ treats one another. And so there's certain sounds of righteousness as a pastor that you walk up and there's situation between brother and brother and sister and sister or brother and sister and husbands and wives and you walk up and you go, oh, that doesn't sound very righteous. That doesn't, that doesn't have the, the ring of truth to it. That's hurtful. <laughs> that's, that's aggressive, right? Those are, those are the things that we hear. But we're people, but we do need the judgments of God. Just because we're people doesn't mean that the, the ways of God need to be just dis, disregarded. So in Exodus 21, let's go quickly. Exodus 21. I, I, I pulled out Exodus 21. Just I mean, there's 36 verses, but verse 1. Go ahead, uh, Ricky Patrick, read verse 1. Now these are the judgments which thou shalt set before them. So this is what God said to Moses. This is what wasn't Moses' idea. This was God's idea telling Moses how to deal with the people problems. All right? Okay, so let's read verse 2 through verse 6. If thou by an Hebrew servant, six years shall he serve. And in the seventh, he shall go out free for nothing. If he came in by himself, he shall go out by himself. If he were married, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master have given him a wife, and she shall have borne him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters, and he shall go out by himself. And if the servant shall plainly say, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out free. Then his master shall bring him unto the judges. He shall also bring him to the door, or unto the doorpost. And his master shall bore his ear through with an owl, an owl, and he shall serve him forever. Wow. So, do you know, if you were, if, 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 um, Dave, you and I were, were Hebrew brothers, right? We're, we're, we're brothers, and, and I got behind on my rent. And then it kind of, you know how things snowball, right? You, you, you snowball. Anybody, anybody, anybody in the financial snowball? Yeah. So, and it's terrible. No matter what you do, you keep going backwards. You keep going backwards. And then, you know, you know then, then Brandy backs into another person's camel. And then you've got to fix the fender on the camel. And then you got, you know, it's just horrible, right? Got to repaint the camel and all these things. So, you know, it just keeps, and then, and then you know, you got, do you have any daughters? Oh, I was going to throw in marriage, but that don't work. <laughs> Joke around our house is, uh, you know, after the wedding. Then we can, you know, have a financial life again. <laughs> Joking. <laughs> but we say that about everything. It's the, jo it's the joke in our house. Uh, so tigers and, uh, oh, my. We just need to start take up an offering and bear one another's <laughs> burdens. I mean, it's just going to be rough. I'm just saying. Um, <laughs> how do, okay, I got to move forward off of that. Um, so, so if you get in so much debt, there is a point where instead of you know throwing you in jail, then you become indentured to me, and you serve me because you owe me, right? So there's an indebtedness. And by this law, if you're a Hebrew brother, then you come unto me and you serve me. And the law was what? How long can he serve me? No matter how much he owes me, he can only serve me how many? Six years. And at the end of those six years, no matter if he's paid the debt off or if he still owes, if he's paid the debt off, then he can go free. But if he owes more than six years, the maximum I can hold him is six years. Why? Because he's my brother. And then it says, well, if he was single when he came in, he's single when he goes out. 
But if in the, in the process he gets married and the master provides, hey, this is awesome, I want you to be happy. You know, you know he's a good employee, you know, he's working with him and all these things. And, and, and he gets ready to time to go and he goes, okay, give me my wife. And the master says, well, no, those are mine. I mean, that's, that's, that's what I provided. So then that, then that brother has to decide if he's going to go or if he's going to stay with his family. See, that's, to God, guess what that is? Righteous. I don't care what your brain says. I don't care what comma you have. God's ways are. Do you see that? Then you see how our culture can override that and we can have a yeah, but, if, and, who, ha, eh. Don't matter. God's dealing with people, isn't he? And he says, this is righteous. See how the Bible works? There's a certain sound. But if you only accustom your ear to what you feel and what you think, you're going to miss the righteousness of God in all of this. Because guess what this culture is driven around? Me and my rights. That's what every desire is built around. Me first mentality. And you know what? The me first mentality is so against the righteousness of God. It actually is not just neutral to the ways of God. It destroys and is very destructive to the ways of God. And so, uh, let's keep reading. Let's uh, 12 through 14. Let's read 12 through 14. He that smiteth a man so that he die shall be surely put to death. And if a man lie not in wait, but God deliver him into his hand, then I will appoint thee a place whither he shall flee. But if a man come presumptuously upon his neighbor to slay him with guile, thou shalt take him from mine altar that he may die. Whew. Somebody say that's the righteousness of God. That's not the, that's not the judgment of man. That's the judgment and righteousness of God. What did God say in his people, with his people? He's the judge. He's the jury, right? He didn't ask for public opinion. If a man murders somebody on accident, right, that man needs to run to what the Bible called was a city of refuge, because the person that was killed or the family of that one that was killed is going to have anger as a response. And I am going to provide a place for you to run. And you need to stay there until that high priest dies. But if you step foot out of that city and you get murdered, then your blood is on your own head. Somebody say that's the righteousness of God. And already some of your brains are going, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. I don't care. God doesn't care. God didn't say, hey, let's take a poll. Any, anybody? He said, but if that man that was murdered, it was done presumptuously by that other man, then you're going to take that man, you're going to put him to death. Somebody say, that's the righteousness of God. I hear some of you already. See, this is what believers have to do with their own personal thoughts. They have to allow the righteousness of God to replace their thoughts. Because your ways are not higher than God's ways. And your thoughts are not higher than God's thoughts. Are they? See, but this is what the world cannot do and refuses to do. It's God's way. This chapter is chocked full. Of example after example after example. You want to know what God thinks about how we deal with each other. He says it. He tells us. Doesn't he? He tells us. He tells us. Now, now, now again, you can, I, I'm out of time. You can, he talks about dishonoring of your parents. Look at verse 15. He that smiteth his father or his mother shall be, uh, shall be surely put to death. See, I know in your mind already you're thinking, well, that's pretty strict. Well, that ought to tell us how God feels about children that dishonor their parents. How serious is God with this? Huh? 
and you think it's just, man, nah, nah, nah. no, 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 no. This was God's judgments, not yours. And you could cry foul all you wanted. But if you lived in the Old Testament, guess what? God is righteous. Somebody say, God is righteous. And that's righteous. You would never point your finger at God and say, that's unrighteous, would you? That's why many people started pointing their finger at Moses and saying, you're unrighteous. But Moses had nothing to do with it. It was God. That's pretty hard stuff, isn't it? That's hardcore. Okay, what is the next verse? 17. And he that curses his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. You know, our schools are a mess because we can't do anything to correct our kids now. We can't discipline them. We can't touch them. We can't do anything with them. And they can disrespect authority all they want. We're, are, is this not a problem in our schools now? We got people right here in our, that, that teach in class. And the greatest problem is they are sometimes afraid for their own life. This is what happens when you disregard God's word. It, it causes consequences in our culture, in our society. It's not, well, we need another law. Yeah, we do. We need God's law to return back to where it should be. And so, wow, I mean, where, where do we stop? Where, see, th this is righteousness. The guy, they get in a fight in verse 18, and, and he smites this guy. And he immobilizes this guy somehow so that he's got to go to the doctor. He's got doctor bills. He doesn't kill him, but he, he, he does damage. The Lord said, well, you don't have to, you know, get damaged yourself, the guy, but you do need to pay for his doctor bills and anything else that goes wrong that he's got to pay. Isn't that cool? It's personal responsibility for what you're doing. You've got an ox, and, and that ox gores a man so that that man dies. What do you do? Kill the ox. Somebody say that's righteous. Let's say you got an ox and you knew that that ox was a wild ox. And you didn't put him up in a pen. You just let him roam. You knew that he was going to gore somebody. You already knew it. Say he's done it before. And you knew he was going to gore. And you didn't do anything to, to contain that ox. And he goes and gores somebody and kills them. Guess what God says to do to the man that owns the ox? Kill him. Somebody say that's righteous. Because you've got to be responsible for your own actions or inactions. What? Yes. Well, I'm going to live for God. Oh, really? How are you going to do that? You, the people love the cloud relationship with God. I'm going to walk with God. Undefinable. Can't touch me. No MC Hammer Christians. Because God does touch you. His righteousness is real and tangible. If you borrow something and it breaks while you got it, what does God say? Replace it. Somebody say that's righteous. But if you, if you borrowed it and the guy that owns it was with you working with it and it breaks in his presence, you don't have to pay. On and on and on and on and on. Two, two, two oxes get in a fight. Two oxes get in a fight. The one ox dies. The other ox is living. The guy says, well, your ox should have been stronger. Mine's the strongest. What do we do? <laughs> well, we sell the living ox for money. We divide the money and we cut the dead ox in half. So you have dinner and I have dinner. Somebody say that's righteous. See, we don't, we don't deal with oxes much, but I'm going to tell you the righteousness of God still touches our lives just as specific as that. And that's what the Holy Ghost is going to try to teach us in our business dealings and how we treat people and how we're living with people. The righteousness of God is powerful. And David said, oh, how I love thy judgments. They're righteous. 
Uh, I'll end. You, you can go home. You can, I'm sure you'll go home and read that because I got your interest peaked, don't I? Got your brain spinning. It's awesome stuff. I put in your notes, if there is no judgment or no righteous judgment, then mercy has no meaning and it has no context. If you say God's a merciful God, if you don't even know the judgments of God, that word has lost all meaning. This is why if, if this, this, if there's no judgment of God, then Christ loses his context. And the blood of the lamb loses his context. Love is lost. If there's no righteous judgments of God, then the cross was not needed. Because the death of the cross was a visible expression of the judgment of God on sin. Wow. 1 Peter 4, 17, it's in your notes. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, somebody say us. The house of God is us. So the time has come that judgment must begin at me, at us, the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel? Can I tell you that the beginning of judgment is in the obedience of the gospel of Christ? Not the end, it's the beginning. Somebody comes toward God and they lift their hands up and say, God, forgive me, I'm a sinner. They have just acknowledged that they have broken the righteous judgments of God. That's where judgment begins, is our acknowledgement that we have broken God's. And we're worthy of the righteous judgment of God. Let's stand. Lord, help us to hear the sound of righteousness. Help us to understand that thy word forever is settled in heaven. Not just the good parts, but the entire word is forever settled in heaven. And last I read, Father, there's going to be a great white throne judgment on the day uh, that you are Lord of Lord and King of Kings. And that throne of grace that is now is going to be turned into a throne of judgment. And on that day, you're going to open up books and you're going to judge men out of the things which are written in the books. And Father, there is no man alive that could stand before you on that day that has ever lived, that will ever be able to say that they are worthy of uh, being saved. The only cry we have is that, God, you're a God of mercy, that there is blood that was shed for our sin. There is forgiveness, God, that no man could ever live up to the whole law, but it doesn't negate the law. It necessitates the the, the mercy of God in our life. I pray that we would have a renewed understanding and vision of the mercy of God and we would have an ear attuned for the sounds of righteousness and we would listen for the teachings of grace that are teaching us the denying ungodliness and worldly lust. We live soberly, righteously, godly in this present world. God, help us to hear the voice of the Spirit today. Let it be applied into our everyday lives. We give you honor. Help us to live in the fear and the reverence of God Almighty. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Hey, 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 hey. Hey, hey, hey. You did right well. <laughs>